The following is a sponsored message from Interfaith Community Services. Voice of San Diego is a nonprofit, and a majority of our budget comes from listeners and readers like you. But we also depend on revenue from grants and advertisers to maintain independence and produce more of the hard-hitting journalism you expect from us. Interfaith Community Services is North San Diego County's largest provider of social services, with programs ranging from food, housing, employment, youth services, addiction recovery, and more, Interfaith serves over 17,000 of their neighbors in need each year. Headquartered in Escondido, their mission is to help people help themselves. And to do that, they need your support. Visit www.interfaithservices.org to learn more. Welcome to those of you listening on News Radio 600 Kogo. This is the voice of San Diego on podcast. My name is Scott Lewis. Here with my friend Andrew Keats. What's up? Let's do it. And Sarah Libby. Hey. How are you guys? Great. Got uh, got your stuff together. You feel good? You had a breakfast burrito the other day. <laughs> feel great. Did. I feel, yeah. I feel great because I didn't have one yeah. and they're bad. You don't want to do that? I'm not even getting into it. <laughs> don't want to do that. Well, we've got a big show. We're going to talk about two propositions, two measures that are on City of San Diego voters' ballots coming up. This is starting to get into the heat of the campaign season. Yeah, it's happening. It just, But it doesn't feel like it, does it? Well, it's a midterm, so there's no... But yeah, it feels like it for me. I don't know. Uh, there are two, um, a lot of measures, but the two that we're going to talk about today, Measure E and Measure G... Talked about a, a bit, but I did a piece recently sort of um, kind of tracking how all of this came together. Just Wednesday, we saw Congressman Scott Peters, Assemblyman Todd Gloria, State Senate President Pro Tempore, Tony Atkins, David Alvarez from the City Council and City Council President Myrtle Cole. They all lined up in support of the SDSU plan and against the Soccer City measure at a Wednesday press conference. They joined Lori Zaff. They join organized labor. They join the conservative Lincoln Club, the chamber, Barbara Bree. Everyone. <laughs> have you ever seen anybody, everybody line up? I guess similarly one, to one, how... One thing. One The thing. Chargers. And the convention center measure. Yeah. The one that failed to even qualify for the ballot. Well, they had support of all the labor and stuff. That's what I'm saying. Oh yeah, like that they have all that support and it yeah. didn't work. Right. <laughs> this is one other time I've ever seen it. Got it. And it didn't mean anything. Basically, though. But I, I'm not. I don't mean that as a prediction at all. I still my prior here is that all of these things matter. But no, it's a good point. That there's only two people, as far as, far as like prominent leaders. Yeah. That I can identify who support the Soccer City plan. Councilman Scott Sherman. Yes. He's all in. Yes. And Mayor Kevin Faulkner, yeah. not normally on an island. Yeah, he's not normally on an island. He's he's built himself a little jetty from his island to the mainland in this issue, though, because yeah. he's not willing to say that he dislikes SDSU West or most things. Right. <laughs> yeah. Voters in November will, of course, decide whether the Soccer City plan should go forward. That one is Measure E. And they'll have to decide or whether the city should have to sell the land to SDSU instead. That's measure G. Or whether neither of those options is adequate. That that would be don't support either. And the ads are on continuous rotation on the Padres games right now, on TV uh, everywhere, on Facebook. If you watch any sports, then you basically watch these ads interrupted by intermittent gameplay. Measure E. Fun. Fast, free, for all SD. Measure G will transform the Mission Valley Stadium property into a world-class education and There's a lot of money going in, uh, both, so there's kind of like three fronts. There's the pro Soccer City Measure E push. There's the pro Measure G push, but then there's the anti Soccer City push, which is separate and, and separately funded. And then there's the anti Measure G G front from the Soccer City guys, which is kind of combined with the other one. So it's it's a uh, it's a big one. There's a lot of money flying around. Million. This might reach ten million dollars total. 
Really? Between both of, between yeah. the, all the associated spending? Yeah, when you think about all the initiatives and everything. So how did we get here? It wasn't always this way. The mayor, Soccer City, SDSU, they all negotiated for a year and came as close to a handshake, as close as a handshake to a deal. I guess you could call it a verbal agreement, but it never materialized. And why? How did that happen? How did we get here? It's a story, in my opinion, of how elites and small rooms can hatch ideas, get everybody fired up, dominate local public affairs for years, and then how other elites can just <laughs> crush them. And uh, it's kind of what I would try to do with this long piece. So I, I published it two weeks ago, finally. Or was it two weeks? Week and a half? And it was a culmination about six months of work. Now, I didn't work six months on this thing, just a, a few minutes a week, of just how close Soccer City and SDSU got to a deal and why it fell apart. And so we're going to talk about that today and, and just a, about these measures. There's basically five main characters, right? There's the Soccer City Partners, led by Mike Stone, Nick Stone, Steve Altman, former president of Qualcomm, and Peter Seidler, the uh, largest owner of the Padres. And uh, Seidler, by the way, is like, I'm neutral now. I'm not, I'm not fighting. these. That's how bad the endorsement game has gone. But uh, that's one, one main character. I'm calling the groups a character. The other group that's a character is SDSU's management. So the leaders, and uh, last year the leader was Elliot Hirschman. Uh, he's now since given way to Sally Roosh, the uh, interim president, who has given way to Adela De La Torre, right? Mm -hmm. Who is the current president. Then the mayor, and the mayor's staff is another character. And then Tom Sudbury, uh, Sudbury Properties. Sudbury is a big deal in the development community, right? Big big guy. I mean, he's also the maybe the, the biggest guy in the room for Lincoln Club associated issues. Yeah, for Republican, Republican Party right. donations and capital, right? Right. Um, Tom Sudbury has a project in particular in, in Mission Valley called Civita, which is, interestingly, almost exactly the same size as the Soccer City uh, plan, same number of units, um, roughly the same you know contours, except for one thing, retail. We'll get into that in a second. And then Jack McGrory. That's a guy. He's a fascinating addition to this playbill because he has he brings so much history with him. All yeah. it it suddenly introduces the entire story of the last twenty years of San Diego history right. into into the mix. So quick backgrounder, Jack McGrory was the city. So it's actually like a shortcut. It's a, a unfortunate shortcut by the screenwriters. Yes. It's just like, <laughs> oh, Han Solo again, huh? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. He is the Han Solo of, of, of civic deals in San Diego. He's, uh, he was the city manager. So the city used to run on a city manager form of government where the mayor was just a member of the city council. And um, Jack McGrory throughout the 90s was the main city manager, the guy... He, he, you know, got deals done. He played council members off each other. He, you know, he would, he would, they'd come asking him for questions and, and information about how the budget works. And he'd say, just take your money and leave me alone. You know, it's just a very a powerful city manager type. And he got a lot of stuff done and some of it controversially. So he's uh, considered the architect of the deal that eventually caused so much problem for the city's finances with the pension system. And he put in a protector so that it wouldn't get so bad, but uh, but they ignored that later. Uh, we don't need to get into that. The point being, he's a fascinating individual who now sits as a trustee on the California State University system. He was also part of the Campanile Foundation before he got that gig. And the Campanile Foundation is uh, a group of advisors and, and fundraisers for the University Powerful Group. So, uh, let's dial back. <laughs> you guys remember the Chargers? They were a team in town, football. Vag vaguely. Yeah. They, uh, they had a big drama where they were going to leave San Diego. And in the so, midst of that this... That all sounds familiar. Yeah. yeah. In the midst of this, there was some interesting conversations going on in the background, right? It seemed pretty clear to a lot of us that the Chargers were marching out of town, but it, nobody quite wanted to admit it, but it sounds like the mayor had some, yeah, some a little side deal going on, right? So this side deal started with a guy named Harlan Stone. 
Harlan Stone is a big time sports and entertainment agent type, and he is friends with Don Garber, the commissioner of Major League Soccer. And uh, Don Garber uh, gets connected and decides to call Mike Stone, Harlan's brother in San Diego, longtime investor. Uh, he's a person in San Diego, hedge fund guy, mm-hmm. yeah, right? yeah, investor. And he um, and he says, "Do you know anybody in San Diego who would like to get on board with a?" soccer team there because we think soccer would be cool there not so much if the chargers stay but if the chargers leave that's that's great that's just gold let's do this and mike stone's like that sounds fun and he starts getting some people together including the former president of qualcomm steve altman uh, peter seidler one of, the, one of the largest owners of the padres all these guys and they say like let's start to do this they all happen to be or a couple of them have to be um, supporters of San Diego State football and athletics uh, as part of this exclusive club called the di- Directors uh, Committee, the Directors Club, right? It's an insider's club of insiders. Exclusive, yeah. 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 $30,000 a year you got to donate. And uh, it's a it's very exclusive. They, they, they say, like, this is an exclusive club on the invite. That's how exclusive it is, right? Oh, man. <laughs> That's, yeah. That is exclusive. And so... <laughs> Uh, they start conversation. Imagine if you like joined an exclusive club and you got it, and there was a sign that was like, "This is exclusive." <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the exclusive club. <laughs> thirty grand a year, or something. Yeah. That's like that. You gotta have wealth to be handing over thirty grand a year to something yeah. like that. That's uh-huh. that's wealth. Yeah. So they start conversations with San Diego State athletics and and San Diego State leadership about well, should we work something out if the Chargers leave. Mm-hmm. And uh, they roped the mayor in, and they they both give a presentation to the leader of Major League Soccer and the mayor, San Diego State, and these soccer guys say, "This is what we're thinking about if the Chargers leave this this plot of land." The mayor's in. Mayor loves it. Good job. Got something in the in the tank. Hell of a PowerPoint. <laughs> great, great. Yeah. And so this is like May 2016. This is, yeah, this is uh, 2016, you know, um, early, yeah, early 2016. Yeah. Things so like, are, we're in the build up towards the Chargers, refer- the Chargers initiative on the ballot, but not there yet. Remember, this is the period after the Chargers lost the, um, the NFL and, owners vote. Yeah, they wanted yeah. to move to LA with the Raiders. And, but also by this point, it had become clear that the Chargers would not be pursuing anything, that they were going to make one last ditch effort to stay, right. but it was not going to be at Mission Valley. It yeah, was going were, to be downtown. They made it very clear right from the beginning, we're not doing Mission Valley. Right. 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 So, yes, exactly. So the mayor's all in. He's like, let's try to figure something out. Um, here's Nick Stone when he came and talked to us about what the mayor was thinking then about how important it was for the soccer guys to work with San Diego State. Kevin pushed really hard, and it, and in fairness to Kevin, like he believed and we believed that we were doing what the university wanted. Mm-hmm. They worked closely with San Diego State University, in particular the top management there. We're talking about uh, the CFO, Tom McCarran, Bob Schultz, the head of real estate assets and the lead architect, uh, uh, Megan Collins, chief of staff to the president, and the president himself, Elliot Hirschman. So there's this fascinating series of meetings between all of these principals and the mayor and um, and the soccer guys as they start to hash and find their way towards a deal, right? Correct. We've we later learned, you know, about these meetings, but I don't think I had real realized until I started doing this research just how intense and um, how they had already dove down to like the marginalia of the the deal. Right from the beginning, the soccer guys are making it clear that, yeah, they're going to help build the stadium. San Diego State's going to help build part of it, but they're going to build a bunch of other stuff around it, including a bunch of homes. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Right. It's There's none of the... So the, with the Chargers, there was always this like back and forth around how we'd pay for it. Like, maybe we'll just use a tax. Maybe it'll be a real estate funded thing. Maybe it'll be this. Maybe it'll be that. Right. There was none of that with this. It was always clear that this was going to be a piece of a major redevelopment project right. and the redevelopment would pay for the stadium. Right. So this all sort of climaxes with this uh, fascinating moment where uh, 
there there's a meeting scheduled at the mayor's office to kind of really like make the final pitch about how the deal's going to look and to really get him fully on board. But then um, as the meeting is is getting set up, and everybody's supposed to be there, by the way, all these, uh, the Peter Seidlers, this, the Elliot Hirschman, the president of the university, and the soccer guys are all going to be in the mayor's office making this final case for this whole deal. This is right at the time when the Chargers are uh, about to announce that they're moving to Los Angeles, right? So this meeting is scheduled. There's uh, hours before it, though. The San Diego State side starts to get cold feet. They're like, eh, I don't know about this presentation you've put together. You need to scrub all references to us sharing the cost of the stadium 50-50. The soccer guys are like, what are you talking about? They freak out. And and everybody says, we can't have this meeting with the mayor. The mayor says, look, I canceled this meeting in Baja. We're going to do this meeting. You know, come and at least show me what this cool stadium is going to look like. And they all say, okay, fine. We'll all go to the meeting. And at the meeting president of the university, describes what's been happening between the two sides as a brotherly tiff. So that's how close these guys were getting, right? Like, we can figure this out or whatever. So the mayor sends them on the way, figure it out. After that, there's this weekend-long meeting, January 21st and 22nd of 2017, where the president of the university and the leader of these soccer investors, Mike Stone and Elliot Hirschman, are having this Week, weekend-long conversation about how to get this thing back on track. They get it back on track. Now, looming is this January, you know, end of January deadline for an application to the Major League Soccer group, right? Yeah. And so they, uh, they finally come to terms on what kind of uh, sharing situation they can have, uh, what kind of land San Diego State University could have, how they'll share the finances. They come to terms. Soccer City decides that day, the next day, to announce to the world and start to come around to all of us and show what they're going to do, right? They even send over a little comment that they're going to release talking about the cooperation and partnership that they've made with and had with the university. And the university just needs to sign off on that. But the university never signs off on that. Happening, happening simultaneously as this stuff starts to come out, there's growing hostility from Tom Sudbury, this developer, this owner and manager of this uh, property called Savita. Now, he's upset by two things. One is he has a bunch of retail in Savita that still needs to get filled with tenants, right? It hasn't even been built yet, much of it, right? Right. And, and he plans on um, developing that into a retail component. The Soccer City plan plans has about 700,000 square feet of retail, a rather large, what they call, entertainment district, right? And he doesn't like that. Sure. <laughs> that's that, that's a, comp- a competitive it's, influence. It's a competitive influence two ways. One is... Retail is the most traffic generating land use that you can have, which stands to reason if you think about it. You, you come and go from your home once leaving and once coming each day. Retail, you drive to the store, you leave the store, you drive to the next place, to the next place, right? So it generates more traffic. So if you have something nearby, all this additional traffic is going to make coming to your location less attractive additionally it's just a straight up competition for tenants and if they build nicer glitzier space it might actually put you in a lower class of of actual retail space exactly and he also like clearly resents that they've not talked to him before you know he's a big close he the mayor is as close of an ally as possible and he hasn't been looped in yeah uh, he also resents the idea that they're going to take this to the ballot as opposed to go through the right. the years long process. Go through the process and play by the same rules. Yeah, and so and like in you know, Civita is a giant project. That it was a process monster. Yeah, right. Like it was years of time getting yes. through the approvals process. And in fact, and interestingly, it had faced opposition from another. Mission Valley developer who was very angry about the process it was going through, and they had to hash out that war 10 years ago. Yeah. So 
that starts to build up and uh it gets to uh the the deal's still on track though the there's a uh deal kind of made but there's people from around the university from this campanile foundation who start to get a little bit uh, nervous about what's going on here is uh kit sickles who is a member of that campanile foundation and he has a lot of respect and support for the president of the university elliot hirschman but he also says this specifically elliot who i think was an outstanding president and a very intelligent guy but he he's not a he was he's not a real estate guy mm -hmm. and uh, you put him in a room with mike stone and nick stone and it ain't fair it ain't fair sickles brings in jack mcgrory Jack McGorry, who we just described, big time player at City Hall for a long time, has himself become a developer of sorts, a consultant on all kinds of major deals, and has built himself a, a, a big portfolio of, of achievements in that area, along with some wealth. And they come in and they're like, this doesn't look good. This is not a good deal for the university. For SDSU. Yeah, yeah, this isn't a good deal for SDSU. Sickles in particular asks one question. He's like, look, if we're paying for half of, the, this, <clears throat> of this stadium, why don't we just get half the land so we can develop that too? And the soccer guys respond and say, look, we're to get all that land ready for development, it's going to cost all this money. We've got to demolish the stadium. we got to do all this prep work. we got to do X, Y, Z to get it going. And so that's a bunch of money that, you know, we're not just going to give to you. And so that starts in motion this, like, bad stream. It's just a bad vein of discussion between the two sides, right? Yeah. But it's still on. Uh, they, uh, there's an effort to keep going and, and, um, and continue to figure this out. But Sudbury starts to get pretty fired up on the other end of things. And there's this fascinating meeting that we'll tell you about if you stick around uh, after the break. Uh, we do this show in partnership with News Radio 600 Kogo. It's uh, broadcast there, but you can follow the whole thing and get the whole shows that we do on your favorite podcasting system whether it's Stitcher or iTunes or Google Voice, Google Play, and all of those are what we are available on. So to our friends at News Radio 600 Kogo and others, thank you and stay tuned for the rest of the show after the break. The following is a sponsored message from American Medical Response. Voice of San Diego is a nonprofit and a majority of our budget comes from listeners and readers like you. But we also depend on revenue from grants and advertisers to maintain independence and produce more of the hard-hitting journalism you expect from us. When accidents, injuries, or emergencies happen, American Medical Response is there. American Medical Response has been caring for patients in San Diego County for over 65 years. As an exclusive 911 emergency medical response provider within the community, AMR wants to remind you to stay safe, San Diego. To learn more about AMR, visit amr.net. We are back. We continue this tale about how Measure E and Measure G became separate things mm -hmm. <laughs> that you have to decide on. Where are you at? Are you, you kind of ambivalent? I don't know. Uh, they, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. It's tough, huh? The, I, I talk to my friends about it, and it's you use the word marginalia. It's like our discussion is entirely our news coverage and discussion is entirely about the marginalia of it. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to voters, they care not at all about the marginalia. The only thing that they'll be making their decision on is on the the highest possible level, the headline numbers. And it it's a, it's a it's a uh, uh. not just numbers though. I think the people's visions are like one is a one is soccer and one is SDSU. Oh, that's and what I, think I mean. That's, yeah, that's what I mean. It's like yeah. the only thing that's going to be decided like, is do you want soccer exactly. or San Diego State football? That's and not really what's before you as a choice. Yeah, exactly. That well, it, I mean, I guess it is. 
I think it is. I, I actually think I guess they're what I right mean to is decide on those terms. Because people don't understand how similar they are. Right. Yeah. The, the that's I think that's the question. Like it's it's basically what team do you want to be able to do more or less a similar type of of development for Mission Valley? Who do you trust to do it in a way that you like or who do you just want to give your support to? Yeah. I mean like I got I guess I just don't expect any typical person or even an atypical person to make their decisions based on like what is most likely to generate the greatest amount of general fund revenue right. 25 years from now yeah. and to like do that kind of, like I, and like if my friends ask me like I quickly will find myself being like well the, the level of certainty associated by the two different river <laughs> park plans it's like no nerd soccer or football right. you know so we left off with um what became probably the most imp- interesting moment i think that i started to understand which was this valentine's day 2017 meeting the mayor and the chamber of commerce uh former mayor jerry sanders current mayor kevin faulkner they kind of realized this thing is headed towards a municipal disaster there's there's ships coming at each other they're gonna collide so they bring in Tom Sudbury, this developer. They bring in the Soccer City guys, and they bring in the mayor. And the whole point is to sit around a big boardroom and not leave until a deal is made. Is, is that what happened? <laughs> it's not what happened. They're in the meeting. I couldn't get anybody to tell me exactly what they said. I, I, I tried. I really did. But what I got was that very quickly into the meeting – Soccer City starts to make a presentation, which I think is really emblematic of their whole presentation so far, which was that it was like, it was basically, here is our plan, and here is Civita, the plan nearby that's much the same size, and here's all the bad things about Civita, and here's how ours doesn't do that, and ours does better. That which, was their approach to winning over the developer yeah. of Civita? Yes, that oh. was, yeah. That, again, that's, it, it didn't work. Hmm. Sudbury was- He didn't like that. He was <laughs> apparently quite mad about how this was huh. going and let it be known that he was quite mad and things got really heated in the meeting. And then uh, the next detail, a lot of people have seized on. I didn't realize people were going to seize on as much as they did, but they did and they keep bringing it up to me, was that Mayor Kevin Faulkner was like, peace out. He just left. I can't left. deal with this. I'm, this is terrible. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> he takes his staff and leaves the room. Apparently, they keep going at it for a while after he leaves. But a lot of people... Was, what is the point once he's left? Yeah. <laughs> like, whatever. I'm just going to tear you to shreds. <laughs> but also, it's just perfect in that, like, the whole point of the meeting now whether or not that was like realistic and maybe it never would have happened but like a few minutes into it he's just like oh this is terrible i can't deal with this well yeah it's like you're there to settle a dispute and then a couple minutes in they start arguing it's like whoa 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 why is everyone fighting right yeah (laughs) that's the that's why we have to have the meeting yeah and and horse trade a little bit or something but i think i think one of the worst things honestly that could have happened to soccer city was that they earned the support of the mayor so soon. And I don't mean like that as in that tanked it, Mm -hmm. but I think it gave them a false sense of confidence Mm. that that ruined their ability, again, to be, you know, tactful and and compromising in situations like this. They, They kept assuming that the mayor would bring it home for them. They definitely went with a hard sell. Right away. Right. I mean, like, right down to their strategic decisions. And that, If you rewind a bit, when, when they announced it, they openly said at first, here's how it's going to work. We're going to collect signatures. When it go, when those signatures go to the city council, they're going to adopt it outright. Bada bing, bada boom. There yeah. will never be a vote. Yeah. And from the outside looking in, the fact that it seems like their main pitch to everyone was like, oh, well, the, we'll just show them, like, pictures of our vision, and that's all we need to do right yeah. little right. did they know <laughs> that the people of san diego are deeply inured to Visual renderings, renderings. <laughs> we've seen so them. many renderings we've all seen the renderings bro <laughs> so <laughs> come better than that 
<laughs> the odd thing is the mayor at this point still thinks a deal's it's like a much like a like a Madison Square Garden crowd when Trey really hits Tweezer reprise. It's like, oh bud, God. this is MSG. We've seen Twee prize before. You're gonna have to give us a little bit more than that. That's a fish yeah. reference. Yeah. <laughs> so break that down. I, I, you're gonna bring that up. I would like you to break that down. I would not okay. like for you to do that. We'll we'll release a special the special podcast <laughs> with him deciphering the words analogy. I just said. Did it, was it a good analogy? It was really good. Yeah, really? exactly. Yeah. Well, somebody in our podcast texting club who knows fish verify that that was a good analogy. Please yeah. exclude if, me from I, all of these communications. Actually, if you're in our podcast texting club and you understood that, just like get my number and let's be friends. <laughs> Just skip the explanation. <laughs> so they think that it's still going to work. But by this time, a new president is coming into the picture. Uh, Elliot Hirschman's like, I'm out too. <laughs> All the leaders are like, peace, good luck with this thing. Uh, the new president comes in, Sally Roosh. She sits down. One of the first meetings she has is with Jack McGrory, who's like, look, people are going to ask why we're just opposed to this. And not offering up another vision. Let's offer up our own vision. Is, are you cool if I come up with a an initiative that benefits San Diego State? And she's like, sure, we can't get involved. Go for it. So he does. And what became Measure G is born. Now, a couple of distinctions here. Measure E is uh, two parts, really. It's a um, change to the municipal code that says, uh, here's all the things that change about uh, about the land use around Mission Valley, and it's a change to the specific plan for Mission Valley, right? That's the initiative along with thousands of pages of like studies about hydrology and traffic and stuff like that, right? Yeah. This Measure G, the San Diego State West plan, the Friends of SDSU put together, is a much simpler document that basically just says, this land we direct and... Um, authorize the city. And it, it says direct, by the way. Yeah. We direct the city to sell this land to San Diego State. Now, there's a similar provision in the Soccer City's plan that says it directs the city to sell and lease the land to guys who own a soccer team. Yeah, some narrowly constituted group that could only right. be... Like how the Chargers measure was like a professional yeah. team in San Diego. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Whatever team that may be. Just, Just one. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, that's the those are the two plans. So uh, McGrory raised and spent a bunch of money in getting Measure G together and, um, and Measure E went forward. Now, in the meantime, there was no actual vision of what San Diego State would do with this land. So they came up with SDSU Mission Valley. And that's what they've been going around town talking about and sort of uh, de you know, demonstrating. And it's a, a very similar type of development, though it includes a lot of uh, land and space for uh, university buildings around the stadium. But it would still have thousands of homes and it would have a, a river park. Yeah, and as they communicated to us, one thing that, that caught my attention when they came in to, to pitch that to us was, if this doesn't work out, let's say SDSU West doesn't pass, this is nonetheless their vision for the future of the university. It might have to come to pass through an RTP, it might have to pass through some state legislation or whatever process it is. This is what they have determined for themselves is the future of the universe. And to build all of the homes and the other uh, infrastructure around this, tear down the stadium, all that, they're going to partner with private developers. They have no idea who those would be, um, but they would partner with private developers who would gain some commercial value out of the land and then maybe transfer it to SDSU over the long term or partner in different ways. Uh, it's it's uh, they've done a lot of development around San Diego State like that. Right now, one of the developers uh, that was also involved with uh, McGrory in in some of these early discussions about whether San Diego State was getting a good deal, uh, and who was who is on this tour with the university, sort of presenting these plans, is John Kratzer. John Kratzer runs JMI Realty, and he is uh, he's a close associate of of um, John Moores. John Moores, the former owner of the Padres and uh, a person who has been very vocal that this land needs to go to San Diego State. 
Kratzer said, told us, right, that he wouldn't take the deal. He wouldn't take the jobs to develop this land, right? Right. Uh, but he did make it clear in our meeting with him uh, about why he and, uh, and his associates are so passionate about it. This is the only meaningful opportunity for the university to expand, and it's a university that's landlocked on 288 acres where they've had challenges, you know, growing on the existing site. And so, so you know, that's, that's kind of why I'm, why I'm here. And so that is it. That's Measure G, and that's Measure E, and that's how we came to get there. I think there's a, there, there are a few takeaways. Um, it's, it, was a, it was amazing to me just how clear this was of a story of, of how things get worked out among a few people very elite individuals and they can sort of set in motion big regional discussions that last years just in their own because of whatever money they have right away to launch a project and to make a decision and to get the mayor's ear right yes absolutely and then it's another discussion about how competitive developers are and how um how much is at stake with their projects and their plans in this area it was also interesting to me, and you pointed this out, uh, Sarah, that there were no women in the room, or very few. Yeah, it was almost like it would be better if there were no women, as, as opposed to like just the one woman who was there, who was not really there on her own accord, but as you know, an associate of Elliot Hirschman, and was kind of derided by a lot of the other men in the group as like chief of no. Yeah. Um, and you know that really rubbed me the wrong way that the only woman involved in this is painted as like somebody with like a rolling pin, just like a harpy who says no to everything. So right. That really bothered me. Right. And I think, um, you know, that was the same case with the Chargers, right? Remember, Absolutely. there was the Chargers discussion was there was no, uh, or if if any, very few women involved in that discussion as well. And it's also just kind of a a testament to like a faltering leadership, right? That the mayor left that meeting where they were trying to get people together. Like maybe he couldn't, like you said, but but um, could he have done something to to get this going? And then on the on the university side. Like, um, it, it seems like the president of the university should have either, A, been able to get his constituents on board with what he had been working out, like all of his donors and all of that group, or B, recognized that they wouldn't like it and gotten out a lot earlier before he wasted a bunch of people's time. Yeah, and as far as leadership, it's also not like Kevin Faulkner came up with a plan for what would be best for the city and pushed that and signed on, you know, the appropriate parties to that. It was like a developer's vision and he signed on to it, which yeah. is sort of backwards. And I've heard that he has like a, a, a regiment for this, like, you know, these things need to be accomplished before I'll sign on to something. Right. And it seems like he abandoned that in this case, like, mm -hmm. like, he obviously was depending on San Diego State getting on board, and they didn't. So how did how did his formula, which is obviously extremely cautious in most cases, break down in that situation? This it seems like there like a lot of different people just had this idea that it'll it it would work out. Um, when Soccer City first came to us, you know they didn't say that SDSU was on board, but they went out of their way to give the impression that like they'd have an announcement soon on San Diego state, you know? I remember and, when they first heard about it, that was the first thought I had. I like, they would not announce this had they not gotten San Diego state on board. But in retrospect, didn't it feel weird even at the time it was like, well, San Diego state's not here and right. like, you're not listing them as a, as a partner. Right. You're kind of talking about this partnership, but you're not, but like, where are they? Right. And so then that eventually fell apart and there was like this presumption that like political support would come. Let's well, let's just keep going. Let's keep pushing forward and political sort support will come. And but I, I mean, the I had the frustration for me about the entire thing is. The big picture idea to begin with was fine and logical. San Diego State does need some space, apparently. San Diego State does need a place to play football, apparently. MLS does want to come here, apparently. We would need a stadium for that, apparently. 
you do need to develop more housing in Mission Valley. It's one of the only places, apparently, that's willing to take it. There is a very large transit station at that location, apparently. There is a decrepit stadium that is useless, surrounded by the biggest parking lot in the city. Like all, the all of these things should be negotiable to a logical solution. The fact that everybody who wanted the same basic contours of a solution instead just rammed their faces against each other in awkward ways without ever kissing is very strange to me. It's like like a bunch of aliens that came here and like could approximate human behavior but not <laughs> quite do it. <laughs> This is this is you at your best. <laughs> Thank you. I don't normally not a huge fan, but <laughs> that's you at your best. That's good stuff. Yeah, I think there's a there's it's it's a tale of San Diego. You know, I mean, this is this exactly. we always aren't they our, all? We always roll our eyes at the, but this is what happens when, uh, for whatever reason, we just can't we can't figure it out. We just can't figure it out. Yeah, I remember Scott Peters, who's now on board with the SDSU plan, his big case for the stadium, like his big pitch was like, can't we do a thing yeah. finally? Yeah. Can we please just do a thing? Yeah. Which is a really stupid question because <laughs> obviously the answer so is clear that we the can't do no. anything. No individual not, thing. Not, not we this do. thing and whatever the next thing you might discuss, the answer to that is no. All right. Well, uh, we'll learn more I'm about this. Skip the next thing conversation. Just <laughs> as soon as it presents itself, be like, "Well, that won't happen. It's nope. a thing." That's basically my beat, though. <laughs> <laughs> you should ju just sit it out and wait until it craters, then be like, "Oh, it's time for my retrospective." <laughs> <laughs> All right, our hero of the week. So, did we decide on Jerry Brown and the legislature? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I'm so good with it. They passed the law. Seems that, like this is this your is guys' gonna, jam. This is going to be a little touchy out there, some of you. I just, just hold on. Just hold your, hold your scooters. We, <laughs> uh, we uh, are awarding them the hero for passing the law that allows people to ride scooters over 18, if they're over 18, uh, without helmets. That makes it consistent with... Uh, Bicycle laws, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I recommend wearing a helmet. I have a dorky one that I got free from bird scooters that I've been wearing. Mm -hmm. It's it's good to wear helmets, but it's also good to have freedom. I don't give a, a, any care at all about freedom. Uh, I want to have as many people as possible on Two wheels? Two wheeled devices on the road because as somebody who commutes every day on a two wheeled device on the road, having more people on those will increase the awareness that we are out there and make me safer and less likely to die. And I wear a helmet, but the single most important thing you could do for me is allow more people to join me on the road to make drivers more aware of us. And so, yeah, this law made my, my life safer. So I got. I'm a, really happy about that. I had a call from uh, a Voice San Diego member who uh, is working a petition to try to get the city to ban these scooters uh, for a short period so that we can figure out what's going on <laughs> and uh, and you know develop some more appropriate regulations for them. And I had you know she she's talking for quite some time and I and when I uh, got to speak I said, well um, I love them and I want to marry them. I think they're beautiful, and I ride them all the time. And um, I and she's like, "Well, you, you can still ride them, you know." And she started to like make clear, like at a different angle, you know, <laughs> we just want to regulate. They can regulate the the sidewalk riding right now, right? Like that's against the law. Yeah. And uh, in a commercial area, you're not allowed to ride a bike on the sidewalk. Right. So we can go ahead and hammer that right now. Yeah, but we should at the same time we should recognize that people don't do that because it's like crazy fun they do it because the roads feel unsafe right and they're so they're they're seeking safety so help so me. one thing we could do is build protected infrastructure on the roads right because the road is a public right-of-way it's for the public it is not the sole provision of cars much as drivers believe that it is so 
how does the series of events so let's say that we get all this data that shows that people use g street mm -hmm. market fifth and all these mostly with the bird scooters mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if we get all that data is the is the thinking then that we will get we'll say like let's build protected lanes on those areas first and um and it'll it, there'll be kind of a tipping point of support for that sort of thing i have no idea we i mean there is a downtown mobility plan that ex that has been adopted as the as a preferred framework for how to build uh many miles of protected segregated right of way for people on skateboards bikes these scooters would certainly qualify uh, on downtown streets it's a funding question at this point what but, but but if if what you're saying is we have all this data from these scooters now and we could use it to make that plan even better that seems fine to me i guess my my question is just like what what would be the what would the tipping point really look like if we had enough people in the streets riding two wheel devices like how would it actually tip into getting stuff done oh it never would oh okay because uh the, the, the no well no no actually different this is has nothing to do with san diego this is purely based on the fact that drivers believe that they're the only people who belong in the road and they hate everyone else because they're a nuisance and they'll work backwards from there whether it's helmets or yeah, exactly. you're they don't slowing really me care down about the sidewalk they don't really care law. yeah this is yeah. it's all phony arguments to get to the outcome you want which is get out of my way so i can get to work faster yes and now this new helmet law took away one one of those things yeah hmm. they're riding around without helmets on ban yeah. them well it's legal <laughs> uh now gr granted i don't think that they should be on sidewalks i think that some of the discussions about limiting the speeds on the boardwalk seem perfectly logical to me i think some of these uh cleaning up how they park this sorts of things should be easy enough but look like i ride my bike to padres games when i go to padres games and i park it to an next in an empty bike rack every game yesterday i parked it around 200 scooters mm -hmm. like there were at least 200 people who came to that game via scooter that typically would have come to the game some other way mm -hmm. so our goat of the week you lose good day sir all right, this one goes to both the Grossmont Union High School District and one of its former employees. So this employee was a sort of a warehouse worker who would kind of congregate outside Grossmont High um, as kids were coming into school and make some pretty lewd, gross comments with coworkers about, you know, girls' bodies and what he would like to do and things of that nature. So... The district tried to fire him. That's what they wanted to do, but instead um, paid him $80,000, which is not quite firing someone, um, to leave and to agree not to sue them for wrongful termination. Um, so that's nice work if you can get it. Yeah, so the quest that Ashley McGlone has been doing about uh, sexual misconduct in the schools, we often find that some of the educators and other school employees who, who get in trouble, they get transferred to other districts or other schools. But this often happens too. Yeah, so what's interesting is that the two men who were talking to each other, they had different outcomes. And so one was transferred to another school and the other was paid $80,000 to leave. And Ashley actually tracked him down and he admitted like, yeah, I was making comments definitely to all my coworkers. we all talked like that to each other all the time we didn't make them to students faces he said you know i would never disrespect a girl that way but i just did it behind her back um yeah. and he also said he I thinks i would never use that kind of language in front of a lady right <laughs> what do you take me for <laughs> he also said he believes he should have gotten a much bigger payout mm -hmm. So how, how much? What do you what do you think he thinks is the number? Like one, when he tells one eleven or one? something. Yeah. Does that know. guy like go to Thanksgiving? And they're like, how are things going? He's like, I, I should have got two hundred thousand dollars. I only got eighty thousand dollars for saying lewd things about your children. Yep. All right. We'll follow all of these stories and more at voicesanigo.org. And please, please get your tickets for Politifest. Go to politifest.org. 
uh, B-O-L-I-T-I-F-E-S-T dot O-R-G, and you can sign up there. We've got a great lineup, Soccer City, SDSU West debate. We've got uh, uh, Mayor Kevin Faulkner and Sacramento Mayor Daryl Steinberg coming. We've got um, uh, Shirley Weber, Lorena Gonzalez, and Assemblyman Chad Mays, uh, all from the state legislature, talk about the future of California. We've got uh, uh, ballot measure explanations. We've got a rent control debate. Uh, all kinds of good Ooh. stuff. Uh, sign up. Go to politifest.org. And uh, we'd love to see you there. And uh, thank you for all those who have uh, bought tickets. And uh, that'll be a, a good event. And I'll be glad when it's over. <laughs> it's been tough to pull together, but I'm really excited about it. And thanks to all our partners, including uh, New Radio 600 Co. You're listening to the Voice of San Diego Podcast Network. Visit voiceofsandiego.org slash podcast to learn more about the rest of the shows in our network. We've got Cura Chaos, a live podcast featuring interviews with movers and shakers from San Diego and Baja, California, and The Kept Faith, a sports podcast. Be sure to give them a try, and thanks for listening.